by many cars. This is also the state of the credits. No credits? Is there any credits? There should be. The wiki project. This is not. That's the one beside you? Should we turn the lights on? Yeah, turn the lights on. Yeah. <laughs> For a minute, I thought that was intentional. <laughs> like to freeze on it, yeah. <laughs> so, what, what we didn't get to see is the, the credit sequence names people on there who helped them, whether they, you know, the years and things like that. So it's unfortunate. I don't know why that happened. Yeah, Obviously, this version might have been, might have preceded all the making of the credit. But well, we did see the full content, right? Yeah. And uh, I wanted to ask you first, like the range of material you had to choose from, like what what went into your decision making. Of which ones to include or which ones not to include. If you want to speak about any of that were yeah, too crazy or erotic or boring to include. I mean, that, that's what's kind of interesting. There was nothing that we edited out. Uh, you know, we, we stayed completely consistent and loyal to the structure that was created, which was to simply go to the next person. And uh, the unknown factor was, in some cases, um, we wouldn't get a response in a week or two weeks, and we'd have to decide to go to somebody else. But it still would be the last frame of the previous minute that that person would then respond to. That happened a couple of times. And then we had to circle around, go to the person that got left out or got passed over. But there was no editing, per se. <coughs> so every, every transition is authentic to that process of the last frame, and you, you could you can tell that some people actually captured the last frame and then worked with it as a, as a transitional element. Um, others juxtapose. I mean, one of my favorite is going from the chickens in the barnyard to the peacock. Yeah. Uh, you know, walking across a, a yard in Miami, yeah. and. Uh, you know, other, other things emerge, the kind of, um, all of the animal imagery that we see is not, you know, it's not built into our idea of what, what would happen, but uh, just something that emerged. Um, and fire is another theme, you could <laughs> say. Uh, but then there's too like a theme in the randomness of it, or just like if you look at the, at times, the seeming absurdity of life, things happen or there are coincidences or you can't find a pattern. It's just like stream of consciousness in a way. Right. It reminded me of like if people like would make more, you know, projects similar to this where you said you get like 10 seconds, you know, because that's kind of how like social media is. People just kind of freely give it, but you, know, you could like you know organize some kind of a. People could do a project you know inspired by this on some level, right? Or even just going out through the uh, the channel, you know, going mm -hmm. using the channel selector and staying on each each channel for a set amount of time would be a similar random process, right? So, th but this was not random because it was inviting each artist to respond to the last frame. Mm. And, um, but that's the only element of continuity that was built into it, I would say. But there seems a lot of real intentionality. So I think part of the continuity was your selection of the people and also coming from you. And the idea that it was actually going to be a completed project gave people a lot of sort of thought and discipline. And I noticed that sometimes uh, I was trying to catch the end of one and the beginning of the next, but then I would find out 
the continuity was later on in that one minute. Mm -hmm. and it wasn't always yeah. right at and you don't always see the number. I mean, uh, actually, uh, we should have prepared the program and given you the program that would identify each participant by the number of the minute. But, um, you know, we considered putting names in so the number, but we went with, in the end, just, just the number. So you could follow with your program along, um, you know, no, may or may not have been an addition. Mm -hmm. Yours is the first minute, right? Your yeah. piece is the first minute? Yes. Yeah. How did you how did you choose the music? How did you choose a title, Exquisite Moving Corpse? And what did you feel yours said? Like? Well that's that's added after the fact to that that still frame. Um that's it. Oh okay. It, how did you choose the title and well, the exquisite moving corpse as a title? Okay. Yeah. So it's the exquisite corpse, as I mentioned before, is is a known kind of uh, parlor game or cafe game uh, from the twenties. And it's pretty well known in the artwork in the history of art um, okay. as a form. It, it's interesting there's there's a gallery here, the Catherine Clark Gallery, that has been using an exquisite corpse structure of inviting artists to uh, make tabletops and then every week a new artist or artist team brings theirs in and has to ref you know, respond to what was there before. So that idea of responding to what was there is part of the exquisite course. How'd you get your music? What? Your music. The music for the piece that you included for the first minute. How did you get the music? Uh, it's my, my neighbor is, uh, plays in the San Francisco Symphony. And because it was the pandemic, if you remember, there was an early period of time where people came out at six o'clock at night and mm -hmm. either banged pots, and he would go out every night uh, with the bassoon, just his oh, instrument, wow. and just play these riffs on the bassoon. <laughs> and so I recorded one, and uh, you know, he was happy to give it to me. Uh, and then I also had uh, this uh, copy of a, the Duchamp bicycle wheel uh, piece, and <coughs> the bicycle wheel on a stool, which there is no uh, original, but for example, the Museum of Modern Art has an, uh, an authorized reproduction of it as a classic piece. But this one is the one I made, you know, myself. <laughs> So it's actually as authentic as the one that's up at Momo. So um, I just put it in the backyard, you know, and use that as a as an uh, ending object because it has the whole weight, hopefully, of the champion. <laughs> well, the wheel certainly continued. The next yeah. one was the wheel. Yeah. Then yeah. there's the tire. Then there's the Cheerios. And, you know, I, I yes. imagine <laughs> that a circular form could go much further into the the overall work, but it disappears at a certain point. Had you made previous to this project films that were experimental in their approach, or was there any similarities to this? Not, not really, but um, let's see. I mean, I think between the three of us, I can't remember exactly how we conceptualized the idea. But uh, it was a collaboration, and um, <clears throat> once once we got to that form, I mean, the name, the exquisite moving corpse, describes it. So uh, then it was just a matter of fine tuning that structure, so to speak, and we alternated since each of us nominated 19 additional artists, mm -hmm. we alternated in in order. So that there would never be two chosen by the same one, you know, same person. Did you say there was a total of 19 artists? Six yeah, because it, uh, and then all times three. Because, because each of us made a piece. That was the 20th. Okay. So 20 times three, 60 minutes. So the three main, I guess, like producers, you all had a say on like 19 or 20 people to invite. Yes. 
Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course that oh, you know, <laughs> sort of changed as we went along. <laughs> one of them, one of the names, Chris Felmer, right? Is who? Was Chris Felmer one of the filmmakers? Uh, yes. Yeah. We had him here for the Cecil Taylor documentary screening. Oh, okay. Last I don't year. Know him. Last year. Yeah. Um, yeah. I recognized his name, James Benning. Yeah. And he's a known like experimental filmmaker for right. several years. Yeah. Those are two and, that I. Uh, Bill Wegman. Yeah. Uh, is known for using the it's a one around the dog as a so that was sort of the yeah. And Tony Owsley, they both did sort of trademark pieces uh, for their minute. You know that they've done. Uh, and some of the other artists are equally well known. Mel Chen is one, but um, others not so well known. And. Uh, I try to make a point of going down generationally and mm -hmm. choosing younger artists. Uh, and because I taught for a number of years, I have several of my students I, I nominated. Uh, and can, can you tell the story about finding the two Irish artists, the Irish women? Yeah, but that's, that's Sean's story. Oh, it's Sean's story. <laughs> okay. That's still a good one. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. So that was an arbitrary find. Right, mm -hmm. right. So uh, you said it was shown at the Roxy. Uh, where else has it been shown? Where has it been shown? Yes. Yeah. So let's see. Um, the, um, it's been shown, uh, the, the premiere was at a uh, experimental video festival in Albuquerque. <laughs> And uh, I was right in the heart of the pandemic, and it was all on uh, Zoom. And uh, that was shown in, uh, in Marfa and Houston. In Houston, it was uh, an alternative art space sponsored, but it was shown in a the theater. And uh, in Marfa, it was connected with another event. And um, then it was shown at the uh, Bob Rauschenberg Gallery at uh, Southwest Florida University. However, that's in Fort Myers. And there it was shown as an installation for, I think, six weeks. But it was interrupted by the hurricane, which shut down the campus. <laughs> they sent all the students home. And uh, the uh, curator of the, the gallery there, uh, moved to Jacksonville, and we continued to show it there in Jacksonville. And it was also shown in Venice at the Emily Harvey Foundation, um, and another place in Europe, um, and finally at a Microscope Gallery in New York. What kind of response have you been getting? The response? No, I mean, it's always, always been pretty positive. Oh, here we showed it at the Roxy. Uh, in the, in the midst of that, in, I think it was in August. Um, I don't know, you know, I kind of want to hear what you think, because uh, to me it was like, <laughs> I feel like we created a monster, you know, it's almost a Frankenstein monster that just, you well, know. Well, you had that piece in there. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. Uh, because it went beyond any ability to control it in terms mm -hmm. of uh, choice of images. And that's, that's kind of interesting, but, you know, I would love to go back and edit a few things out of there and tighten it up a little bit, but can't, we can't do that. I thought it was going to be, in the beginning, like more heavy on like human alienation, but then it kind of just morphed into, I don't know, as it's for other things, other realms or moments. Does anybody yeah. want to share yeah. their uh, feelings about it or? what they think from your question. Yeah. Well, um, as Jeff knows, uh, poets uh, it, uh, of us in, um, in France, in North Beach, we often did at dinner parties the exquisite corpse written style, <laughs> and where you write three lines, fold it over, next person yeah. sees the next line, writes three more. Yeah. and. One thing I remember that Jeff will probably remember too is the bigger your group, um, that 
you sometimes get farther and farther away from <laughs> the the image or imagery or, or riff that, that started out, and that's part of the adventure. But then, just like this, there are these wonderful accidents that will take place that several people who are far apart, like there, there was grass and, and um, uh, that came up several times, grass and fields, no. and with a horizon line that echoed a couple of times. But with 60, my god, I think the biggest exquisite corpse we ever did maybe had 22. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, with the, with the first segments that you had with, with the circle from, from the Duchamp wheel to the tire to the Cheerios, um, that's a pretty close <laughs> example. I mean, but you know, re uh, reacted and recognized the cleverness of those, each of those transitions, I think. Uh -huh. But then, you know, that just... And then it just takes off. off. So yeah. it's, it's harder to, to appreciate transitions the further we go into it. And yeah. Then, uh, yeah. But that's part of the adventure of it, too. I found it, I found it very inspiring. We're working on the same team. We're working on uh, a project called the uh, One Hour Art School. And it will also be 60 one minute lessons <laughs> where we invite uh, uh, people to make, uh, artists to make uh, lessons. It's a very different project because it won't be linear. Uh, so we're going to collect them all and then mount them on a website. And you can, you can wander through it and you can choose people you might recognize. Or, uh, that's about halfway there now. And um, I think that might be it. <laughs> Can you talk <laughs> a little complete? about your teaching experience? You mentioned earlier you're, you was a professor of film, film studies, film yeah. history, yeah. production. Yeah. Well, I taught, uh, first I taught at uh, in UC San Diego in the visual arts department in the early 80s at a time when Alan Capra was there and uh, David and Eleanor Anton and who were involved with performance art and uh, conceptual art. And I was hired to do uh, video. I, I, my degree is in architecture. Uh, and so I had, and suddenly I had to teach video and film classes, <laughs> including you know, technique and production, a kind of traditional introduction to uh, forms and equipment. But um, I then moved to UC Santa Cruz where the, the film was being taught in theater arts. And uh, so that was a whole different sort of approach. Uh, in both cases, the students were interesting, you know. And um, I was learning a lot <laughs> as I went along. Uh, and just one anecdote, I ended up teaching screenwriting in Santa Cruz because there was nobody else to do it. So I, again, I had to study <laughs> screenwriting. And I remember, um, of course, the three-act structure is the fundamental idea behind you know, writing a narrative screenplay. And one, one of my students was working on a documentary, and he came in and he, he asked me, does the three-act structure apply in documentary? <laughs> and I said, oh, yes, of course it does. <laughs> you know, because it's a structure. And every project needs a structure of some kind. And um, so funny because recently I saw on Facebook he had just won, he had written a screenplay that won an award, you know, uh, in a film festival. Uh, doesn't mean it's going to get made, but, uh, and, uh, so I reminded him, you know, of that incident in the three-act structure. But uh, a lot of artists teach with the idea that they're just teaching to support their, not, you know, not an integration with their creative activity, but it's a separate way of making money. And, uh, and I, I was sort of thinking that when I began, and by the time I retired 22 years, 23 years later, I realized the the teaching itself had rewards that were far greater than monetary rewards. Mm -hmm. And that was continuing to keep in touch with students and learn what they're doing and kind of be able to follow them through their lives in a way.
doesn't have, you know, many of them just disappear from your life, but some of them um, I, I've kept in touch with. If you don't mind, I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, you, like you're the film curator here, right? So are you a movie maker? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to show your films here? I showed mine last year. We could show some of them again okay. if people are interested. Yeah. Get enough votes, I guess. Or yeah, it's been a little while. It would be fun. Mm -hmm. I found it inspiring. Like to I for a while thought more collaborative art or collaborative film projects, or um, even with music. Or even anonymous art. You just have like a collective of people made this and you don't really know. It's just you're supposed to focus on like the content. I kind of like that concept. And it takes like most of the ego out of it at least, you know. Um, with, you, with educators today and like with kids, how do you see film or, or like a project like this? How could that be helpful? Hmm. Well, um, you know, one thing, uh, during my teaching career, I remember I always used to begin classes by talking about the difference between film and video. Because when I entered the, the art world and worked with video, uh, there was this complete divide between filmmaking and video making. And video kind of developed in the art world uh, alongside performance art and installation art and these other experiments during the 1970s. And filmmakers hated video because the, the image was so grainy and it's black and white and, you know, film image projected looked beautiful and video didn't look beautiful. But video had the quality that you couldn't tell the difference between a live camera signal and a recorded I mean, that's, that seems crazy to think about today. But, and that's why they would, uh, on television, they would have to say a, a title, recorded earlier, you know, in some <laughs> cases, because you couldn't, in terms of the image itself, you couldn't differentiate whether it was live or not. And that presence of video was, you know, the, probably the most unique quality of it, initially, in terms of working with it as an artist. And now, I, I, you know, I would never teach that class because there, it's the merger of the technology of film and video is co complete and it's all digital. So that, I mean, it, in my history of teaching, that's, that's a tremendous change that the, the medium has gone through. And uh, you know, now I, I shoot on my iPhone because you know, the, the quality is good. It's, as a fifty thousand dollar camera, really, yeah. and uh, you know, at the beginning, it was all about carrying the recorder over your shoulder and trying to be make a steady shot. Not everybody could do that. Okay, since you brought that up about your iPhone, do you know how many of those um, mm. were shot with? A oh, these pieces. I think many of them were. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, not everybody, uh, you know, was really a video artist or had that much experience. Dick Higgins is more of a poet, I think, and he was the one who came on and said, I don't have that much to say. <laughs> you know, yeah. Somebody yeah. else was shooting it for him. But there was one that was somewhat centered around Elvis, and mm -hmm. I just noticed that the way the colors were used was like if you were watching an old, I don't know, Eight millimeter, eight millimeter family film. Um, the colors were just sort of weird looking, um, and the family was in the kitchen. And oh, yeah, yeah, that was great. I was just wondering that. Do uh, you think that was shot on a? Wasn't that on a TV or or on a Joel? larger camera? No, I'm not sure which which shot. Which one was it? It was the one centered around Elvis. Wasn't, wasn't the Billy Joel, Joel, the Billy Joel Wasn't that video. Billy Joel oh, the was TV Billy Joel. video? Yeah, that's interesting. It was, took place in the kitchen and the, the colors. Yeah. Was, was it a song, like we start, we didn't start the fire? Was that like a yeah, song playing? Yeah, that was a song. Is that the same one though? Yeah. 
I don't know if it's two different ones. I think you can get you. Is that the same? Um, just start the fire and then they use the clip, yeah, the Billy Joel music yeah. video for their piece. The Billy yeah. Joel. Billy Joel. The song oh, we didn't start in the fire. Right, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's the one you're describing, but I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 I really don't know because it's, uh, it looks just like a music video to me. Yeah. Yeah. And but the colors of the But maybe he appropriated it and <laughs> added to it. I don't know. Maybe yeah. on the colors, yeah. Just as somebody interpolated the Zabruder film. Oh yes, yes. The uh, the one that uh, begins with the peacock and then it goes to uh, a sequence where uh, she shot as they're releasing, I think, seabirds oh, right. back mm -hmm. into the wild, right? And what happens in that shot, that individual shot, is that you would think. It's about the releasing of the of the birds, hmm. but she she keeps shooting, and then this butterfly comes and lands on, oh, yeah. and yeah. that to me is like just you know, because I used to tell students all oh, it's let the camera run after you think it's time to call cut or <laughs> stop shooting because often things show up in that moment afterwards <laughs> that are amazing, and that was an example. Yeah, it ended with the... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you saw your students with the camera run after the final shot? But how long? The final shot where? No, when you teach, you said, you told your students, yeah. let the camera run. Yeah, after they think well, it's the especially final in shot. documentary where mm -hmm. you don't know, you know, you're not scripting, you're not working from it, and, and it's not a dialogue sequence that's like, oh, things can happen. <laughs> And, you know, you're not paying a lot for the film rolling through the camera either because you're shooting with your iPhone and you're shooting video so you can afford it. Hmm, to do that. Anything else? Any other questions? That's the lesson I want to leave you with, that little, that one idea. Mm -hmm. Say it again. What's the one thing? Yeah. When you think it's time to stop the shot, just pause and let it roll for another minute. Something might happen in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. It would be amazing. Especially if you're out in the real world, you know. Um, yeah. Thank you for uh, joining us today. My pleasure. And also, well. I want to say that it's, uh, the Exquisite Movie Corpse is now available, uh, you know, without a, a password. <laughs> <laughs> so it's now so released to the what, world. So what do you, uh, you need to watch it on, um, YouTube or something, is that what you mean? I'm not. Where do people see it if they want to watch it? Well, it's, yeah. a, it's on Vimeo, and now I've got to figure out why it stopped and we didn't see the credits. Oh. If this was maybe the wrong version, you know. Uh, so, but I think if you if you do a search within Vimeo, you yeah. would find it. Not YouTube, it's not on YouTube. And on the Clarion website, there's a list of all the artists' names. Oh, mm -hmm. oh yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. With the yeah. synopsis and yeah. the we, we have a handout of that, yeah. but we didn't get that together. I think it's number two, I think, on the website. I think it's the number to match. Yeah. yeah. And Cliff and Jeff, how did you two do? We showed a movie called Citizen. I'm not losing my, my mind. I'm giving it away in December by um, Bill, William, Farley. Bill Farley, a local filmmaker in San Francisco. And you've known each other for years, yeah. I, I That imagine. film was made, I think, in 1983 or 82. 82. 82. So, yeah. yeah. So no, that was a good one. Longer than that. Um, yeah, the next screening is the 25th. Is there any other events we should mention, Claire, before we? We have a uh, poetry reading next Saturday. Uh, one, two, three. Uh, and then we have a jazz band on the 25th, um, Ultra World X Tact. Um, it's a jazz band with Asian flair. And then you mentioned the film screening. The 25th is uh, Blossoms of Fire by uh, Maureen Gosling, a local mm -hmm. filmmaker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks again for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.